Perfect. We're rolling. Mr. Worthington, thank you for taking the time, sir. I know you've been busy. Thank you. No, not that busy right now. <laughs> <laughs> What's gearing up? You know, you got Sammy kind of rolling around, gearing up her training for the season and everything else. Yeah. So one thing I kind of wanted to bring up, which was one of my first ever, uh, I knew as a, when I was a young skier competing and stuff like that, I always remember I'm mean, a super young, five, six years old, Trace Worthington, the stud, the man, the myth, Trace the ace. And I was actually back on, because uh, I'm originally from New York, I was back on this family um, vacation and we were in Montauk on Long Island. I don't know if you know where that is. Yeah, yeah, yeah I do. We're, we're in this surf shop and I'm curious because I don't know if you're going to remember this or not, but um, we're in this surf shop uh, in Montauk and I go into the store and there is this Trace, uh, Trace Worthington Extreme Skis and it was like a keychain with a, it was like Vocal and Technica. Yeah. You just put like your fingers in the boots and you could yeah. like, ride around on like rails or, or something like that. You know, I mean, this it is just going. But I, have, I have one set left. I have, you one, have one, set, okay. bit, one set left. Yeah. <laughs> so my daughters crack up about it. You know, they're just like, oh, geez. They're like, really? This is the stuff like this is what went down when you were on the team. I'm like, yeah, this is the, this was cool back then. You it know, was, if you want to know who had a pair of those, I have those in a memory box somewhere. <laughs> Trace Worthington Extreme Skis. They're not vintage because they're out of the package. But in a, in a surf shop in New York, I was like, oh, my God, Trace Worthington Extreme Skis. Totally. You can stick your fingers <laughs> in them, do dappies and stuff. Like, ah. Yeah, no, it was, uh, it was awesome. But yeah. speaking to your uh, legendary career, I mean, 79 World Cup podiums, two-time Olympian, really mm -hmm. a pioneer and push, push kind of the, the sport along. And athletically and just kind of after athletics as well what what's kind of what's driven you what's the driving force you would say in your career man I, I just you know it was uh it was tough for me to actually retire from the sport after um you know so many great um memories so many great people that i was surrounded by coaches everything else and in 97 when i decided to to retire from the sport uh it was super difficult obviously like anybody um, yourself included, right. To kind of just pull yourself out of it. And, um, but I had so much drive competitively still going at that time. I just wasn't feeling good competitively. I wasn't feeling good physically. Um, and so when I, I just parlayed that energy right into, into business, you know, I started some stuff with Buzz Patterson flying ace productions right out of the gate. Um, you know, I was able to offer a tremendous amount of jobs, you know, doing TV and, uh, commentary. I lucked out. Uh, actually, right when I retired from the sport, I got a call from TNT, which was the uh, you know network at the time that partnered with CBS in the '98 Nagano game mm -hmm. games, and uh, I was able to go there uh, as their analyst for freestyle skiing and reporter, kind of an overall guy, just to be there and represent. Um, the CBS job was already taken, and I was too late to get in on that. Uh, but I lucked out with, with Nikki Stone, Eric Burgess, and of course, Johnny Mosley being, you know, really yeah. the key element there to, um, to really launch kind of my, helped my TV career, to be honest with you, because there were so many people needing me to give them information. And I was such an insider in the sport for those three uh, that it actually helped out in, the te in television. So, I mean, as, sim as simple as just a TNT kind of reaches out like, hey, we need someone that's kind of been around and you've had uh, so much uh, success in your career and, and you kind of get, because it is somewhat of a little bit uh, of a unique sport, right? To be able to understand what's going on. And you're extremely yeah. unique in that unique sport in the fact that, you know, aerials, moguls, I mean, nowadays, everyone, yeah. it's very specific. Nine years old, you're either a mogul skier or you're going into free ride or you're going into alpine or you're doing aerials. And, and back then, I mean, combined was multiple sports, right? You had uh, ballet, which doesn't even exist anymore, much to Chris Marchetti's yeah. chagrin, but for everyone, <laughs> we're happy that it's gone. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it was, uh, you know, combined was a big deal uh, when I was when I was competing, it, it, it actually, you know, contributed to, to the success of how many World Cups that I was able to win. You know, I was fortunate at the time to win, you know, multiple events and World Cup or multiple World Cups because I had more chances. Um, and that's, you know, why I had so many victories, I think, in my career, obviously, because the combined, you know, they, they awarded um, ballet. You could get you could win as a, as a, as a ballet skier individually, mm -hmm. mogul skier, aerialist. So you had three shots there plus another shot it combined 
Um, I was at the time winning aerial events in, and, and also at the end of the weekend winning the combined. And so that rolling up obviously added to the, the you know, the, the World Cup win count. But um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, that was the cool thing back then. And, and then everything kind of started splitting off when, when things got uh, specialized in the Olympics. You know, Johnny had to part ways with combined to win his gold in Nagano. Um, and then that's when it kind of started to break off a little bit. And at the beginning of the 2000s is when kind of ballet dissolved and then combined dissolved and, and then everybody specialized. And then you have now a lot of different sports, like you said, now that are Olympic medal sports, including free skiing. So yeah, it's changed dramatically um, all around. It's tough. It's tough as a parent trying to figure out where your kid fits, you know? <laughs> I mean, kind of, kind of talking to that a little bit. I mean, do you think that, that it's a little bit too specific, like too early? I mean, sometimes, I mean, I get the, the you know, you see some of the statistics with, baseball parents and kids are throwing out yep. getting Tommy John surgery at like 11 and 12 because right. they've been specifically, you're going to be the next Justin Verlander and we're starting you at eight and this is how you want to go. And I mean, it seems like it's, it's kind of hard. Cause I know when I went, I mean, I played football, I wrestled and then skied and it wasn't like wow. you, you know, you're, you're doing this one thing and that's kind of it. it. It It's, it's hard. You're absolutely right. And, and, and the, the, you know, I guess, um, you know, I have my own personal opinions on it. Then there's a sports science opinion behind it. Sure. Um, you know, I'm a big fan of, of what you're saying. I mean, I grew up super diverse through football, baseball, everything, traditional sports. Not many people know that because it's never really been in any of the PR that I've been in. But, you know, I was, a, I was a great soccer player. I was the fastest kid on the football team. I was the fastest kid on the track field. I was, you know, I, I couldn't hit a ball in baseball, but I was fast. So I'd get around the base. <laughs> um, but that diversity definitely added, I think, to the success of, of my ski career. Um, and yeah, I, I agree with you. The, the, you know, the issue is, is that some of the kids that do specialize do have success. And so they're kind of a needle in the haystack and then they succeed. And I feel like all the other parents start chasing that. So they're like, Whoa, I got to quit all this other stuff. Yeah. Um, where I think helps build their morale. It help, you know, helps build their body as you and I both know physically, mentally, everything else, being a team player in a team sport. And then, you know, coming on over into an individual sport, like freestyle skiing, I think all that helps. Um, you know, my daughter specifically had to sort of lay off soccer recently uh, mm -hmm. because it's, you know, everyone's getting bigger and better and more physical. And so the risk of injury is greater. Um, and so it felt right to kind of pull her from that and then, you know, go for it in skiing. Mm -hmm. um, it just depends on what age, I guess. But I'm a big fan of as long as you can be, you know, in multiple yeah. sports and get that experience is the better. Well, I think also it helps like if you're if you're able to be pulled away from it to it, it kind of keeps that that passion and that flame, right? When you're young, your your parents kind of lead you. You know, I was just following my dad into the moguls when I was five because I thought yeah. skiing was fun, yeah. and then I was like, oh my god, this is great. But I still had those other things, so that flame was kind of still there, and and yeah. you need that, right? When you're eighteen, nineteen, like it's definitely more of a job and instead, especially, you know, skiing or whatever else, like that's your passion. And, and you kind of need that joy from the younger life to, to feed it through because it's not always fun. Like some days training, getting up early and water ramping, hiking up the stairs, getting in 20 jumps a day. Like it sucks if some days yeah. are not always, you know, when you have the breakthrough, it's always great, but you know, it's <laughs> day, not many people are there to see it. You know, that's why it's totally. so rewarding with the coaches and stuff, but it's one of those things where it, it's, it's crazy. I, I, I think it's just so much more specialized I mean, and everything else. And you hit the nail on the head. I mean, two things is, is the passion. And that's why I was successful in, in, in what I did is because I loved it every single day I got up, you couldn't peel me off the hill. You know, I took the public bus to, to when I lived in winter park, Colorado, when I was 12, 13, 14 years old, um, every day to the mountain, I didn't need resources. I could get myself there. I just needed the ski, you know, the season's pass. That's all I asked right. my dad for um, and get up on the mountain. You couldn't, you know, eight to four is when I skied, no matter what, if there was a, a scheduled training that day, then I'd be there for that, whatever it might be. But I was there eight to four. So if it, and it started at 10 and ended at two, I'd be there, you know, that was, I'd be, you know, you were there too. Yeah. And like, that's what you did. And, um, you know, I think that's, that, that's something that is a little bit scary. Like, I feel like that's gone a little bit sometimes and, um, you know, and, and when it does become a job is when you need to be out. Um, and right. that's, again, my opinion, but I woke up one morning, it's funny you mentioned water ramps and jumping into the water at Park City. And, and I woke up and I was like, I just don't want to go. And I quit that day. And I've never, I've never touched a pair. Of, I, I, that was it. And, and Wayne Hiltzabrand, my coach was like, that's pretty funny. I'll see you here in a minute. And I'm like, no, I'm done. 
I'm, I'm done. I'm out. And I was just like, I, I woke up this morning dreading going up there. And I'm like, that's when I knew in my head, I was like, I'm finished. I don't want, this is a job. This right. shouldn't be a job. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. So, so what kind of drove you in early on? You know, so you say that eight to four when, when you were younger there, what, what was that uh, factor? Was it you're going up with your parents and kind of how did you, how did you fall in love with skiing? I was, I was a weekend warrior in the Midwest. Um, so I was going to all the, you know, wild mountain trail hogging, Highland Hills where I grew up, going to after school, Buck Hill, where Lindsey Vaughn, you know, skied. And, um, it, you know, so I, I was at Midwest, just like I couldn't get enough skiing and it was only weekends. I could go maybe only one day. Um, my dad, uh, decided to, my parents got divorced when I was early, uh, younger and my dad decided to move out to Colorado. Okay. Uh, and he was young, <laughs> very young when he decided to move out. And I was, and my mom was like, this is a cool opportunity. You should go hang with your dad out in Colorado. My brother and I moved with him when I was 12 and, and, and that was it. It was kind of over because I couldn't believe it. Dude, you wouldn't believe it. Like I was at winter, in Winter Park. I was one of the only people that skied that lived there. Like one of the only young kids that lived there, teenagers that actually skied. Um, it just hadn't been the town wasn't filled yet with like our town in park city mm -hmm. where there's just people moving here to do that or whatever it might be there's born skiers here um you know you're born like literally skiing a year later uh there it was like i was the only one i was i was like blown away like yeah. well i mean when <laughs> exactly, park, I school in granby colorado not much that there right even now i mean it's starting to grow up a little bit more but the first couple times like competing there or going to the first time I went to watch an event was to see uh Nate Roberts at the Sprint Grand National in like 99 or something and there was nothing in Winter Park other than like that Pizza Hut and like the the Viking yeah. <laughs> so for for you to to kind of get in and and I guess there's not much I mean at least at Winter Park at the time there wasn't too much else to do other than all right we're gonna we're gonna get some good skiing in yeah, sorry, you froze up. You froze up a little bit there for oh, a second. No, so, but yeah, um, it's uh, uh, it, it, it's a, it's a, it's a great spot, and and I was like, could you imagine a kid who just loved skiing from the Midwest and just I just love hucking tricks. You know, I was back in the day when you know people talk about ski patrol ripping jumps down. All true stories. That's what that was me when I was a kid uh, in the Midwest, and I go out to Winter Park and I have the entire mountain to myself. And then the school goes to a four-day school week, which they still have, um, to, like, save money. So the budgets were low. So I had a three-day ski week. In addition to the day, I, the powder day I take off that my dad would let me take off. So I was, like, skiing four days a week. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <rad. laughs> At 13 years old, you know. Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, and, 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 and like many skiers uh, and, and a lot of the free skiers that I see right now and some of the freestyle skiers, but – they just skied the mountain and they just did what they wanted to do. They skied with their friends and they weren't too structured and they weren't in too much of a structured, um, controlled uh, training environment. And they just got good because of that. And, right. you know, I don't think I never had freestyle wasn't even in the Olympics. It wasn't even on the radar. The Olympics yeah. wasn't even, you know, a thing with freestyle skiing because it, it wasn't allowed. Right. Um, and so to be, you know, all of a sudden, 88, you know, Olympics comes around in Calgary and I'm a, I'm a teenager and I find out, whoa, we're like, this is an Olympic sport. That's sweet, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I'm just still hitting the mountain and competing, starting to compete a lot. Um, and then I, I was like, wow, I, I actually have a shot at this. Like I have a shot at going to the Olympics like, yeah. if I stay focused, you know? Um, but it didn't exist at the time. So, which goes back to just going out and skiing and having fun and passion, not with a goal of being an Olympic skier right. any time in my life. Yeah. I mean, I picked a sport that wasn't in the Olympics. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, that's, that's, uh, just, just the passion there, you know, I mean, that's, that's awesome to, uh, awesome yeah. to kind of think that, uh, you know, everything kind of opened up, opened up for a reason. Now, where, when did, like, when you first got into it, were there even like competitions and stuff kind of around that you could yeah. do locally? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, there was full competitions by then and, and, okay. and, uh, they were fairly ramped up and, uh, <clears throat> you know, Colorado had a good circuit. Um, you know, you'd go over to Breckenridge and Steamboat, um, so Winter Park, a basin, I think had a competition around then and, um, it's all changed now, but yeah, I mean, pretty much the, the series at all, you know, yeah. Yeah. Up. But then I, you know, when I was 15, I was, um, the funny part is, is like, you know, the whole, the, like inverted aerials weren't allowed in the United States and, mm -hmm. you know, in the eighties. 
Um, and in fact, got banned for several years. And, you know, there's a lot of people that kept kicked off the US ski team. There's a big story behind that. Um, but I was part of that as a young teenager trying to do inverted aerials, but I couldn't. <laughs> I was allowed. <laughs> But there was this thing called the Junior World Championships, which you've competed in, right? You, uh, so the, I, they, they didn't have it the two years I would have gone. It was the break in uh, when I would have been able to go. Oh, of course. So, yeah, of course. And then <laughs> they have it in uh, Valmalenko after. Right. <laughs> Reed Schneiderman, Ryan Riley, and I rue the day because we would have gone. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, we, like, it was so funny because I was like, I got to, you know, I, I'm going over to this Junior Worlds in, in 1986. And I'm like, I, you know. I, I'd love to do inverts, you know? And they're like, well, you can't because they're not allowed. I'm like, yeah, but they're allowed at Junior Worlds and I'm out of the country, so I'm not going to get banned. And then uh, John and Park Smalley were like, well, shit, if you can tilt one over, let's, you know, let's yeah. figure it out. Yeah. So Chris Seaman and I went and built the jump on Burkhead Pass. Okay. And and uh, he still builds it up there sometimes too, right? So um, <laughs> I went, pulled over a bunch of backflips, um, got some doubles going actually. And uh, next thing you know, like go to Junior Worlds, and I had no idea where I sat amongst like comparing myself. I had no measurables of anything, right. and I was feeling so good about these double backs. I tilted over a lay tuck, and then the next trick I did a lay full single twisting double and won Junior Worlds at eighty six. Wow! Um, and that was like boom, I'm I'm rolling. And that's when my dad was like, "Well, you're pretty good. You're pretty good, at this man." <laughs> He was one junior worlds. I'm like, yeah, I guess. And so that's really when it kicked in, to be honest with you. That's when I was starting to get recognized and starting to get invited to a couple things. And, you know, um, but upright aerials were still the determining factor of getting on the U.S. inverted aerial team. That's crazy. Did you know that? Yeah, no, like, that's crazy. Have, yeah, so the nationals was uprights. And then, yeah, it was crazy. And then you'd have to do well at uprights to get on the U.S. inverted aerial team. <laughs> that's, that's super crazy yeah, yeah. no they have well they still have i mean when i when i was in you could still uprights was definitely still uh an event that was going on i mean they right. probably stopped doing upright events in like 2002 or something or something kind of yeah. along along those lines yeah, it was a little before that i think you're right yeah you're right. somewhere right in there because i remember with the first you know eight nine years old you want to do upright okay you know bogus basin or wherever yeah. else they had the up you know they had the uprights there but yeah so 86 uh, you know kind of starting out in there what is the driving kind of factor there? Is it just you're going out to have fun or you're going, because there are no real expectations, right? Like you say, you come back and your dad's like, hey, you got, you're pretty good at this. You know, you're a junior yeah. world champ. How about that? Yeah, and, and what's changed between then and now is like you didn't have to have a ton of like, like you had to have resources, but you didn't have to have, like nobody was ahead of each other mm -hmm. financially. Like it right. didn't matter if you, like we grew up very poor, right? And so we, I never had the, you know, that behind me but right. my dad was just he was into it he was like this is pretty cool so you know get your seasons pass and um we get you on that team and you take the free bus there every day and you know you got discounted lunches and you you rolled right and then right. you'd figure out borrowing money from your grandparents to get to an event or two right and <laughs> um, now i feel like if you if you don't have this you know level of finance finances behind you it's like i don't know if the talent's gonna surface right, right. because um, you know, if the talent doesn't have the backing, the talent's going to dwindle quickly. Right. Um, you know, and so at the time I was like, I can do this and I can compete against kids from, you know, affluent communities or, you know, yeah. uh, families. Mm -hmm. Um, and it didn't make a difference because right. talent actually trumped anything <laughs> yeah. when I was oh, growing absolutely. up. And, and that's when I was like, I can go full steam ahead. And, um, that's when I started working with Chris Seaman more. In Winter Park, we bounced trampoline all summer long, every single day, eight hours a day, like in spotting harnesses, um, trying to ramp up to get up to a level of inverted aerials, which would okay. be comparable to the best in the world. And <clears throat> at the age of 17, I was already thinking of how I could beat Lloyd Langlois. You know, I was never like, you know, I just, I was always setting my standards super high, okay. which may not be the right thing to do. It might not be the right thing to do now. But it's, it's what I did. I was like, okay, if I want to be the best in the world at this, which I think I have a shot at, um, what's Lloyd doing? And what's Phil LaRoche doing? And what's Alain LaRoche doing? And what's Yves LaRoche doing? And I was like, this is, the Quebec Air Force was a standard, uh -huh. right? Yeah. And I worked tight with Chris Haslock, um, Fuzz Federson. I mean, we were the inverted team, Jim Kleiner, Mike Larson, Bobby Evans. Like we were kind of like, you know, Chip Milner, like that day. Right. We were all just like, 
super unit. I know you've had this too with your teammates. Like we were tight. Like yeah. we were, we were going after the world. And even though we were an individual sport, we were going to spit the best guy in there at all times. And sometimes I was that guy. Right. I was like, I was like, I, I, I'm killing it today. And they're just like, let's figure out how to get you on the podium. You know, like people were yeah. like, let's slip the in run for you. Let's buff the jump out. I'm like, yeah. you know, you don't have to do that. And they're like, well, I didn't make the final. So I'm like, we got to get you up there now. Yeah. yeah. That was how we worked. No, that camaraderie is, it's something super, it's so unique too, because I mean, you are competing, it is you against the hill, but it's also you against these guys. And it's one of those things like when I know when I've made like finals and, and things of that nature and some of my other teammates didn't, you could, I could always hear them at the bottom and they were the yeah. loudest screams yeah. and most probably obnoxious screams out there. And I knew <laughs> that they were genuine and vice versa. Like if I had a bad day, I'd be cheering everyone else on and, and it kind of, it, it really does create, cause you, you, you know, you travel the world, you go to Vermont, you go to Australia, you go all over the, all of these places with, you know, just four or five guys. And uh, it really yeah. just creates such a unique bond. Right. Yeah. And we had, you know, we were also fortunate now, which has changed in freestyle is we, we travel together. And I know that's very, you know, it's, that's different. That's changed. And it's uh, very rare that the mobile skiers will be with the aerialists. Right. Um, and so when we had the combined, it was like, you know, there's an entire week spent at these resorts and, uh, you know, I'd have, I'd be training, you know, three days leading into a three day competition. I had one day off per week. Mm -hmm. Um, it was tough. It was stressful. I was competing every single day, but like you'd have the ballet skiers were finished on Friday. Yeah. And so you'd have like Jan Boer and Ellen Breen and Lane Spina. And I mean, just the legends of, of, of freestyle, but of course in the ballet space, that were the loudest, as you mentioned, the loudest people at the bottom of the hill yeah. during the mogul event and then during the aerial event. With some mogul skiers wrapped up, then then you had for the aerial uh, for aerials on Sunday, yep. like you have both the ballet skiers and the mogul skiers, and you'd have this giant U.S. posse at the bottom, um, yeah. and it was it was different and it felt good, man. It was really cool. Yeah, it's unique. I mean, they don't really, uh, especially just because how separated everything is. I mean, the last time I can remember kind of going through something like that was in. Calgary 2009 they did Noram finals and they put all the disciplines there it was half pipe it was aerials it was more and so all those yeah, people kind of came in and it made a super cool like unique fun week because usually you know the mobile skiers will go off for the aerial so you know everyone's kind of got their own tour but that's yeah. kind of the last time I remember and you know nationals usually uh was like that too until kind of kind of the last couple of years it hasn't hasn't been quite the same right. started to separate that out but that always made for for such it's such cool to, it's cool to see him pulling world championships back together though yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and, and everybody you know half pipe every everybody's here mm -hmm. um i think that's 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 why i mean that's really cool that uh they figured that out you know yeah no for sure mini olympics <laughs> yeah exactly get us get them together it, you know it creates such a better uh, event and it kind of builds a bond in the in the community i mean the community already for freestyle is fairly small so to <laughs> you know if you can keep that bond a little bit that'll that'll right. definitely help so i mean looking back on your career and kind of after you know moving into broadcasting and things like that what what are kind of some habits that kind of help you stay the course so you know you're able to do your homework and kind of stay focused on on whether uh you're broadcasting about a purina dog event or it's bmx mountain biking or it's avp volleyball i mean i'm sure there's a lot of research and everything else that's got to kind of go into whatever you're going to be covering uh, so what you know what kind of habits or what's something that you do that kind of helps you succeed each and every day with that i think for me it was um uh, you know, when I had a tough time with this in school, but then it, 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 it didn't matter because I had this discipline in, in, in skiing through my career um, that I was always prepared and, you know, and I always positioned myself to do things that I love. Um, and that was a big thing. There's a lot of things in broadcasting that I turned down and didn't accept or didn't go after because I just knew that I wasn't really going to be passionate about it. Okay. Um, you know, the, the, hard, the, the most challenging part about that is like, is learning about others. That's what you're doing right now with your podcast. Like is you have to actually now, you know, set yourself aside and learn about others and their life sure. and their stories. And you have to tell those stories. Um, and you know, what I was able to do is, is really focus on, um, uh, it was, I was super disciplined. Like I, I just wanted to, every, every event that I went into, like I'd go into skiing events 
and I'd look at my coaches, what, you know, Wayne Hildebrand and, you know, Haslock was my coach for, for a while. Those guys, Frank Bear was my coach for a year, the year I won world championships, uh, Wayne Hildebrand and Frankie. And I was always like, I'm going to make, you know, like, let me handle my part. You guys do your part. I'm going to make you guys look good at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Like, that's what I, I always went in there, like, going, I'm going to make everybody else look good. I'm going to make the U.S. ski team look good. I'm going to make myself look good. I'm going to make my coaches look good by performing well. And if I didn't, I, I put everything into it, every single ounce of energy and mental capability that I had, all my bandwidth in my brain was like put into the event. Mm -hmm. I've kind of taken that into broadcasting, like every single event that I go to. Okay. Um, I want to make my director happy. I want to make my producer happy. I want to make my co-host, you know, if Johnny Mosley sit next to me, if Sean Smith's next to me, like I want to lead those guys. I want to end the broadcast with nobody saying we could have done this better and if that's the case, we took, we, you know, we take constructive criticism, but I always wanted to leave it going, wow, dude, you, you know, like yeah. I, you, you, you killed it. Like I didn't have to do anything, you know, like right. that's, that's still what I do. Um, and it's not easy and it, you go into the broadcast and it sounds fun and it, it is what, that's what you want. But at the end of the day, like nobody knows that I have it like an 18 hour rule, like every single broadcast that I do, I put 18 hours into. And yeah. so um, and I feel like if I don't, I know it, I know what that timing is. I don't have a stopwatch, but I right. know that if I'm coming up short and I get scared coming into the broadcast, cause if it's live, mm -hmm. I'm like, man, I don't feel prepared. I only studied for 14 hours, but usually we do fine. But like that discipline has been paying off in, in, in broadcasting. There's no question about it. You can't just be an ex athlete and go right into it, you know? Right. Sure. But, oh yeah. It's just going to, I'm, you know, I, I, I killed it on World Cup. You know, I'm going to, you know, <laughs> exactly. everybody, all of a sudden they, they, they last for about a year. If you haven't noticed, even football right. commentators, right. Yeah. because they actually have to work. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's not up there. Just kind of, just kind of. So, so that uh, discipline, I mean, where, where does that come? Is that from, from mom, dad, brother, or, or kind of coaches coming in? Because it's a, yeah. it's a stark contrast when it comes to freestyle, right? Freestyle is as it sounds. It's obviously it's gotten less over the years, but you know, yeah. it's just kind of a fun thing. You ride around the mountain. You loved it so much. You're up there eight to four and you're, you're enjoying training. And then the, the discipline side, I mean, obviously it's propelled yeah. you to such success in 18 hours. I mean, you know, it's get, giving in a lot of prep and, and it sounds yeah. like it's almost a little bit of like fear of failure. You want to make sure everyone else is taken care of and you want to make yeah. sure that, that there's no failure going on. Yeah. You know, and, and by the way, multiple, like we do multiple shows in a weekend. Yeah. And so, like, you know, not 18 hours per hour long show is probably aggressive, but like, you know, we'll go into a weekend. I have, you know, a snowboard show, um, you know, I have a free skiing show and then I have, you know, two mobile shows. And so it's just kind of like that discipline going in. Um, but it, it's, it's, it's not, you know, my father wasn't a, you know, super like, you know, hardcore yeah. disciplinary guy. It was like, you know, if you want a trampoline at the age of 14 then you should, you know, you should try to figure out a job. And so I've been working since I was 14 years old and I, you know, I, I, I worked at Pizza Hut in Winter Park for, for two years. I bought a trampoline. I bought my skis. I bought all that stuff myself. And so I didn't take anything for granted, which I think just parlayed. And then I, you know, and then when I was on the U.S. ski team, um, you know, I did, I, I think I did a really good job of, of utilizing the resources. I never really complained about the U.S. ski team. I, I got to know the, you know, constituents and the, and the donors and the stakeholders and, all the people, I got to know them well. I got to know the producers of, you know, whoever was producing the shows and, and uh, in our event at the time. And I just felt like that was the key. Um, and I know you've done that too yourself. I mean, you stand out as one of those people that I've seen do that. Like you're, you're still plugged into the people that helped you get there. You're still plugged into the community, but you've taken those, um, those resources that you've had available to you and you've, you've applied them. Sure. And, and yeah. you've used them. And I think a lot of athletes don't do that. I think it's, you know, and, and that's, that's a detriment to their post athletic career because there are so many great people. There are so many smart people that we're surrounded by throughout our years of competing mm -hmm. um, that I think it's, it, it, it'd be silly if you didn't like try to work that angle, you know, and, yeah. that, and that just played into my success because so many people gave me a shot right. and I didn't want to let them down. I'm like, Oh wow. Watch what you wish for. You know, I go, <laughs> to, M I go to NBC. I'm like, Hey, can I do the 2002 Olympics? They're like, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll put you on the list. And next thing you know, I have the job and I'm like, Oh, this, you know, then I start getting freaked out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I better, like, is this, is this live? You know, they're like, yeah, <laughs> to 20 million people. Yeah. Like, Oh, 
So that was tough. And then um, I don't know if you know, like this, and then, you know, I was an, a color commentator for the sport of freestyle, but then I, I realized quickly that freestyle skiing only was going to be on the air for X amount of events per season, which right. was like two World Cups, Lake Placid and, and, and Deer Valley, let's say. Um, and uh, then I had to move into a play-by-play -play role quickly um, right. and become a broadcaster opposed to an athlete. Um, and that was a whole different game. That was a big game changer for me. That was a six-year process mm -hmm. to move into a different role of broadcasting. And, and what kind of process is that like? So, I mean, to go through a play-by-play, -play because, I mean, you know, there's so many different things. Like, you're watching a football game and, like, okay, yeah, everything's bad. But, I mean, that's got to be a shit ton of work to be able to go through and not only have the prep for it, but just to transition. Because, right, if you see an aerial jump or you see a mogul, you know, mogul run or whatever's going on, you know it in your sleep. You'd be like, all right, he's a little backseat. He's a little yeah. bit late. You know, he didn't quite hit his takeoff. You know, he's coming a little short there. He had to stretch yeah. it down. When it's coming into play-by-play -play of – you know, doing uh, AVP volleyball or something like that. I mean, it's just got to be a totally different animal. Yeah. Well, AVP was, I was reporting on the AVP, which okay. kind of helped me parlay. Again, diversity is key in broadcasting. Diversity is key in what you're, you know, what you're doing right now. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's definitely something you got to look at. If you want to go to the next level, um, you got to school yourself in it quickly. And um, otherwise you're going to be known as the freestyle guy, you know, um, sure. other, that's it. And you're pigeonholed into that world and then you're never really coming out of it. Right. Um, so I was like, I got it. I have to get into this different role, which took a tremendous amount of effort. Like I said, probably over six years, seven years, the guys from Echo Entertainment, like Hugh Arian and, um, Spence Walla, all those guys helped me, you know, build in that play by play space. And that's why I was doing mountain biking and everything else, um, as a play by play guy. And you're leading the show. Um, you're leading it. Nobody's, you know, like you're leading your podcast right now. Like nobody's, you know, you have people in your ear. Yep. You're leading the show. You have to come in and out of commercial breaks. You have to lead into features. You have to tell stories. Mm -hmm. Whereas color commentator, it's super fun because you just kind of kick back. You come in with some research, but you get to just, you can just talk cool stuff the whole time. <laughs> and even if people don't really understand you, it doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. You know, like you have Mosley comes in and he's incredibly prepared. And he probably doesn't use half the stuff that he's prepared because he just doesn't need to, but he's always overly prepared, which is great. Right. But he just kicks back. He gets to tell the audience like cool yeah. stuff, you know, yeah. and Smitty yeah. like yeah. goes by and hucks a double by mistake. Like he just gets to have fun. <laughs> and I have the producers in my ear, like, you know, okay, we got to go here next. And then remember to tease this. And then you got so-and-so up next. Don't forget about this. And I'm like taking notes right here. Like, yeah, it's, it's very, it's scary. Um, but it is um, the coolest thing I've ever done since competing. Like it is the most adrenaline filled thing that I've, that, that I've ever done. And so like with Red Bull, it's all live, all the cliff diving stuff. Uh, Olympics is live. Like my producer got my ear at the Olympics in uh, 2018. Mm -hmm. He's like, you ready? All right. In 10, nine, eight, don't worry. There's 20 million people watching seven, <laughs> six, five. I'm like, you're an ass. <laughs> so, but it was, uh, it's, 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 it's really cool. And that's a whole entire now team feel that I had when I was competing. Mm -hmm. And I absolutely just love it, man. It's so cool and fun. And uh, I get to talk about freestyle skiing a lot, you know? Right. You get to throw that in there too. That's it. So, so what was the first event that you did live? I mean, was that when you, when you did that first kind of event, did you know like, okay, this is a great transition for me from skiing? Cause I still kind of get that nice adrenaline run. Still got some butterflies going. Like I feel prepared. I feel like I'm ready to go, but We'll see what happens once the cameras start rolling. Yeah, the scary part was we did all these package shows. So, you know, a long time ago with the Jeep King of the Mountain series, we did it all post-production in L.A. Okay. Um, so I grew up as a post-production play-by-play guy, which is a great thing because you learn. Um, but what you haven't done, what I haven't done is live. Mm -hmm. And it's a whole different beast. And so I finally got a shot with, uh, like, the, the World Championships of wakeboarding with Red Bull. Okay. Um, not too long ago. It was only like six years ago, seven years ago. Um, Sal Mesakela was with me and I was like, oh, Sal, I'm like, I'm with Sal Mesakela. Like this is freaking me out. Um, I did some X Games live. Uh, and then I just, I actually did better live than I did pre-recorded. Um, and yeah. so it was, it was super fun. And, you know, from there, the Red Bull guys gave me a shot uh, at live. And I've now been on the, you know, Red Bull Cliff Diving World Series for six straight years now. Um, and then that actually helped me with NBC uh, because NBC was like, you know, you've been doing your work, you know? Yeah. Like we've, you know, I sent them the reels and they were like, wow, uh, 
you're live strong, you know, like come on board, you know, back, back to live TV. First live event with NBC was the Olympics in 2018 cool. with NBC anyway, but I've done yeah. pre-recorded stuff for them for years, but not live. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty cool. So you would say uh, for yourself better, it was, it was better for you to kind of go in and do the lot. You know, you get the, the pre-recording was kind of fun, but that, that extra added pressure kind of, you feel like you yeah. better kind of with those live reels and everything else. That's Yeah, I, I like, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a lot of fun. It's back, it's back competing again, you know, <laughs> totally back competing. You got to be prepared coming in. You can't, you know, once, once you're on, you're on and um, it's, it's tough. I mean, and then these guys get back in your ear and they're like, Hey, we're going to cut off when we come back from break, we, you know, scratch so-and-so we're not showing so so we're not showing so-and-so we're going to pick it up with, you know, have a tall shim cut, right? Like, they're like, right. you know, we're going to pick it up. We lost these two guys. And I'm like scraping through my notes, like trying to figure out like that next person and you set them up, get your analyst going and then you, you know, producers in your ear and um, they're like, Hey, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to go to break. We're going to come back. We're going to show these two athletes. You're going to see the winner circle. Then you're going to go, you know, you're going to throw to Liam back in the studio, you know, like, yeah, it just, that's what you're doing the whole time. So it's really hard to listen to your color guy. <laughs> I've, I, admit, I mean, it's, it's crazy. Yeah. As, like, as you're saying it, because everything looks, when you see some of that, uh, that product, I mean, it looks, uh, so different, you know, you, and that's the way it's supposed to, it's just presented yeah. nice, easy, everything comes in and out. You don't really kind of hear any of that. Uh, it sounds like the chaos that's happening in the background. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's good to have, it's, it's good to have like relationships with the person you're doing color commentary with. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I have Johnny typically and Sean Smith and, you know, I, I, I can nudge Smitty and that means like, I'm in trouble. I got to listen to my producer because we're going a different direction. I got to take some notes over here. You don't see me on camera. Right. Um, and, and, and Smitty will look at me and he'll be like, like, I got it. And he'll just carry it until I'm ready to come back in. And then I'll just go like this and I'll be ready to back. So there's a lot of like sign language and fun stuff that goes along with it. Your producer's kind of running it, but you have fun with it. I mean, there's a lot of really, those are the challenging stuff, but like, it's super fun. Like, you know, it's, it's, it's live and, you know, you'd like to be on site, like, at, you know, Deer Valley World Championships or World Cup, but we're right. doing it all from Connecticut now and, you know, Patrick. we're far away. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, I mean, it's, it comes through, it comes through uh, awesome though. I mean, that's, that's really cool. So yeah, cool. Speak, speaking, kind of going through the transition, I mean, I guess it could be skiing and going through the broadcasting i mean just kind of speak a little bit to the to the perseverance because you know we're talking about the good times and the things uh, of that nature but it's not always uh, that way right i mean you do have a lot of bad days some days some of the recordings you don't feel good about or maybe as you said you got 14 hours of prep instead of the the 18 yeah. so you didn't quite feel as uh, as prepared i mean what's kind of the the perseverance that you need yeah, it's, um, yeah, I mean, you have to be super disciplined. You have to carve out time. You have to work with your family on carving that time out uh, and to, to prep and, you know, which is tough sometimes because it's like, you know, no, I can't go to the soccer game. No, I can't go, you know, watch jumping or mm -hmm. can't go to the ski race or something like that. But like, you know, you're just like, I got, I got to prep. And um, now with everybody at home too, it's even more difficult because everybody's at home. Right. Uh, <laughs> um, and so you have to find that time and find that space. Um, but it, it, it's, I mean, good thing I competed for a long time and I, and I, and I, and I lost more than I won. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, that was, that helped me prepare mentally. Like I can't take it too serious. Like I really, I'm super hard on myself. Um, you know, with, with broadcasting, I'm super hard on, you know, delivering a great show. And sometimes like, oh man, my producer was giving me crap last year. It was so funny. I had this killer show. It was one of the freestyle shows. It was like, you know. He was like Taiwu China, you know, you know Taiwu, Japan. It was Taiwu Japan, China. I don't know, you know, one, either one. <laughs> oh, uh, the, uh, Japan. So, yes, no, Taiwu China. <laughs> see, I should know that, right? Um, so, like, you get done with it, and you're like rolling out. Like the last thing you do is roll out. Mm -hmm. Like right on. So and so is the win. You know, yeah. Jalen Koff with the second place finish. You know what I mean? Rolls up in the points to third place, and that'll wrap it up. Join us tomorrow. We'll be right back here for dual mogul competition. You know, for Sean Smith and Trace Wins, you know, like, yeah. see, you know, like, you know, we'll see you tomorrow. And I like messed up my last name. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> like, and they're like, it was, it was so fun. I came out in the control room and, you know, there's the productions are big. Like when you guys yeah. watch the shows, there's not just us, like there's a team of seven. 
that are in the control room and there's everybody's cracking up. So my whole thing is shot. My confidence is just like, you've got to be kidding me. Can't say my name. <laughs> uh, and it was just funny, but little stuff like that just perks you and bugs you. And as a perfectionist, it's like, you know, you ski in bumps and you're like, really? I just, I just skied 10 straight runs top to bottom with no flaws and my pole breaks, mm -hmm. you know, like, are yeah. you really? <laughs> you right. Yeah. No, um, but you power through it. Um, everybody, you know, I, you, you know, you're not going to get fired over it. <laughs> right. Yeah. You know? And you come back and you just, it's, it is what it is, you know, mm -hmm. and the viewer understands it. You know, they're just like, whatever, you know, yeah. I don't think they care that much. They give you crap for a few minutes and that's about it. <laughs> right. Yeah. Then you move on. So, I mean, it's kind of speaking back a little bit, you talked a little bit about that kind of perfectionism. I mean, is that, would you say kind of one of those driving forces in, in your career moving out? I mean, were you always like, all right, this has got to be perfect. That's why you put in all this time and yeah. kind of all that, all that effort. Cause it's been interesting with a bunch of different people I've talked to. There's been so many different like driving factors whether yeah. it's like hating to lose is the only, re you know, or fear of failure or just, you know, there's so many different things. So that's, it's, uh, perfectionism. Yeah. Was that, was that a big thing for you or still is, I would say? It, yeah, I think so. Um, it was feel, you know, fear of failure, all that stuff. I didn't really, that was for me though, you know, my coaches, my dad, I mean, my parents, like my, my mom, it, it was, she's just a fan, Like right? My grandparents were just a fan. They could care less what I did. You know what I mean? Sure. It's like seventh at the Olympics. And it's like, you're the seventh best skier on the planet. That's insane. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but everyone's like, you didn't win a medal. And I'm like, no, but I, I, you know, I got fifth, you know, like, <laughs> um, and, and it just, but it, yeah, I, I, I just, I just loved that feeling of, of, of representing and, 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 um, again, I never felt like super selfish about it. I always felt like going out and just, you know, having a good time and seeing what happens. I think I, I disguised it pretty well. Like I always looked like I was having a good time because I was, and I kept loose on the hill. I was mm -hmm. cracking jokes and, you know, you probably know, I don't know if you were like that or other people, you know. Um, but at the end of the day, I was fierce. Like once I get, once, you know, once I was told to go, it was fierce. Now I wasn't that good at moguls. Like I was good, but like, I wasn't like, I always was nervous in moguls mm -hmm. and, and ballet was just like a placeholder because I was in combined. Like I had to just do it. Right. But aerials is like, I, I used to just like, I was so confident in aerials. I just, you know, just, just look at my coach and be like, I got this dude. This is mine. Like these guys are all scared up here right now because of the weather. Right. You know, everybody's freaking out because of this or that or the sugary landing. And I'm like, this is going to be awesome. All the, all the work and skiing that I did on Mary Jane and avoiding rocks and bumps and trees in October were paid off, you know? Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, it just was, you know, I guess going back to it, um, maybe just, just love, love that feeling, you know? And mm -hmm. I was never super hard on myself. Like maybe for a few minutes after the event, sure, after sure. I didn't do well, off the podium, out of the top 10, out of the top 16, whatever, it, I, just, I got over it pretty quickly. Right. That fierceness, I like that. That's, uh, that's good. I haven't, okay. I haven't heard, uh, you know, that kind of fierce mindset and, and especially knowing that confidence is so huge, you know? I mean, it's yeah. so hard to gain and it's so easy to lose. It's yeah. To, like, just think How were you? What type, what type of skier were you? You were... Uh, I would say I was definitely, I mean, I got into the sport to be the best mobile skier. I yeah. never cool. got into it to jump which was always like, I was like, you know, it was uprights. And then the transition just from my, you know, 18 years of competing, it went from people doing spreads and twisters to by the last year I was done, people were doing double full and cork 10 and a few right. people attempting cork 14s. I'm like, what the fuck is going yeah, on? This is, not yeah. I got, this is not what I got into. I just wanted yeah. to ski. And yeah. that part got less and less, right? The, the yeah. courses started getting yeah. shorter and shorter, it became less and less about the skiing and, you know, I was putting a lipstick on a pig for several years and I always thought of myself as a hard worker, but I knew that jumping was my weak. I mean, it always was my weakness. It was kind of always, yep. so I knew that I was at a, at a disadvantage there. And I would say towards the end, I mean, I got about, I think I probably tapped out and I was about as good as I could be as a jumper. Yeah. Um, but I mean, as a, as a competitor, it was always, uh, I always felt that, that I always skied better once it was competition uh, and once the course was worse. Cause I knew I was a better, better skier. So if it was really glare ice and people were afraid that yeah. always made me more confident and more positive. I was like, okay, people. Yeah. I was like the same way. As well for me. <laughs> I was like the same way we'd be jumping world cups. I mean, back when I was competing, there were 17 world cups. It wasn't, you know, three or four That's area. Crazy. World cups. 
That's it was 17. I'd spend my whole life was never in the United States. I mean, it was only a little part of the time, but I'd be all the way through like Valentine's day into, you know, I mean, ever like all the way into the spring before nationals was in April. Mm -hmm. So we'd be in March and March was like raining and slushy in Europe and France would compete in that, like Scandinavia. And I just, I, I, I thrived off it. Like you, I was like, I was like, I have this, like, this is going to be so much better than everybody else because I had like a super diverse takeoff. Mm -hmm. You know, I could do everything, you know, yeah. just because I was used to do all these, and all these people were like, so rope, they were robots and they could right. only handle certain conditions. Um, and I always knew I had them <laughs> before the day even started. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, I mean, that's awesome going in and, and that transition. So key. I mean, luckily for me, I would say at a good point in my career, I found uh, Rick Shaner, uh, who's coaching at Watson. Yeah. I mean, he's, he's the man, the myth, the legend for sure. And he's a, you know, he's a gem. Yeah, yeah, he really, is. Uh, and he, he doesn't get talked about enough for uh, his skiing uh, coaching as well. I mean, everyone kind of knew him as the jump guy and he absolutely helped my jumps, but he, help my skiing so much as well and he i'm yeah. sure he's definitely helping out uh helping out sammy there Sam, yeah quite, yeah quite a bit yeah. yeah everybody loves rick man he's great <laughs> he loves rick and he just wants to be <laughs> unknown he's like i I'd never seen never heard <laughs> <laughs> exactly so for kind of people uh going out whether they're business or whether they're going into uh broadcasting or, or public speaking you know it's kind of one of those things uh was chatting about it the other day with uh with nikki stone about how it's uh, people fear speaking in public more than mm -hmm. death i mean it, they're so afraid to just get in front of a group and and kind of talk and obviously seven six don't worry it's only 20 million people listening yeah. in you're fine it's live like what what would you kind of say for you know what would the advice be for them or, or approaches kind of navigating through their fears i mean i think there's a lot of things you can do i course wise i've never done any of that stuff mm -hmm. um but i think um, yeah, I, I, I don't know what it's like to not be able to do that. I've been able to do that early on. Um, mm -hmm. and that actually came from, I was a shy kid. Um, uh, but I got, if anybody wanted to get started early, they should do things in school early on. It's what I didn't do. Um, you know, in whatever classes, you know, in high school and junior high that you can get involved in where you have to actually speak in front of the class. Mm -hmm. I actually had to do that a couple of times and it helped. Like it got over the fear of being shy because people listen and that was pretty cool. Right. Um, and then I started with, when I started flying Ace Productions with Fuzz, we started doing shows in like Placid, like way back in the day. Okay. Um, we did aerial shows and I got on the microphone and I just announced, you know, I announced. And then the, our crowds got bigger and bigger and bigger. And then we brought that, you know, to on the road with trampolines. And then I was speaking to very large groups with, um, uh, uh, you know, before the Olympics in 98. Um, and then before the Olympics in 2002. Uh, so um, I just, that's how I did it. I eased my way into it, but if you don't do it, and then the first time out of the gate is speaking in front of a large group, it's tough. Right. If you do some stuff early on just to ease yourself into it, I think it's what you're doing now with podcasts is even a start, right? People just talking and having conversations. Yeah, um, no, absolutely. Because there are some great stories out there that uh, for athletes, there's some unbelievable stories. They just can't tell them because they're, they're just, yeah, they're afraid. Yeah, you know, get out and speak. Well it's, well, it's it's interesting. You know, I had I was up uh, coaching in Mount Hood a few weeks ago, and I was driving up some kids from the from the airport, and they were talking about how they did this presentation in class, and it was like you know, 10, 15 minute presentation, and it was the first time they'd ever done a presentation like in front of the class, right? And the their teacher at the end was like, "Wow, that was awful." you should not do, you know, your presentation was like terrible <laughs> and just like ripped them a new one. And I'm like, well, what do you expect? You have to actually do it. It's going to be awful at the beginning. You got to start somewhere. Like <laughs> don't just tear them apart on it. You know, you got to build them up. <laughs> I know. I know exactly. It's, it, it is funny. Um, but I think, you know, it's, you hope they do more of that now because mm -hmm. there are, you know, everything's done digitally. Yeah. Um, you know, and there's just, it's all, it's all texting and Snapchatting and, you know, that's where they're communicating. And so there's a space to face and, you know, communication. I think that's going to be, um, unless that is a part of business, which I don't know, I'm just old school, but yeah. I've always been a face to face person and, you know, meet people, whether it's my sponsors or whatever it is. Like I never really wanted to have an agent, you know, mm -hmm. I was like, I was like, if I had an agent, which I did for a little while, like, I'd be like, well, can I go with you to the meeting and meet the person? Like I'd never had the right. negotiation. I was always like, can I get on the phone too? Because 
shouldn't they know me? <laughs> like, I'm representing their brand. Right. These are going to uh, be Trace Worthington's extreme skis. I kind of yeah, to say, exactly. Just show them what. <laughs> yeah, uh, Betsy. You know, remember Betsy? You know, yep. Betsy and mm -hmm. Betsy. I helped her. You know, launch the Target. You know, the Target team. Mm -hmm. um, I went into Target with Betsy in Minneapolis. That you know, super cool. And yeah. I was like, "Well, does you know, won't, won't the executives want to hear from one of the athletes? Like, I'll go in there." Mm -hmm. Just, you know, I'll keep my mouth shut when I don't know anything, but I'll, you know, get them all fired up and psyched, you know, and yeah. that's what you felt like was the thing to do back then. I fear that that's not going to be the thing in the future or it could slow things down for some of the kids, like that face-to-face, -face, you know, interaction and conversation, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's definitely interesting to see because I feel like they're definitely more, at least most of the kids dealing with th these days are more introverted. They're more looking on their phone and, you know, it was yeah. one of those things where I was, uh, we were up at hood and I was just kind of, everyone was sitting on the couch and I was just observing, you know, I was just kind of in the background, you know, and like all of them just face down, you know, just on it. I'm like, wow, this is, we never use, you know, it never used to, used to happen. It's, it's, we all used to like, all right, let's go out for a run. We're sitting here. We're bored. Let's go for a hike. Let's yeah. go. And now, you know, you got to drag them off the couch. Like, Hey, we're going to go pick huckleberries. Like, oh. Yeah. At least, like, at least hang out and make fun of each other. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, get some good banter back and forth, right? Yeah. I'd be like, I'd be at Mount Hood at Gubby Camp when I was younger, and I'd be like, you know, Steve Roxburgh, Valley Skier, and it'd be like, mm -hmm. you know, he'd be like, hey, Sp you know, Lane Speed and these guys be like, hey, let's go give Rob and Smitty some shit. You know, we just go like pound on their condo door. And <laughs> you know? Yeah, absolutely. Like, that was it. That's what you do. And, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's fine. I, I see some of the kids cruising around They're They're social, but yeah, you, you, it's, it's pretty, pretty crazy how everything's kind of, you know, on the screens and you hope that doesn't affect the, uh, the bottom line when it comes to their ability to compete. Right. Um, yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, yeah. And, and progress. Uh, and if they're all doing it, maybe that's the new world and we're just, it is what it is, you know? Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, and it's also made it harder with COVID and everything else going on, you know, the original plan and still the plan for this is, you know, uh, be in studio, be in person. You know, I think that makes it way more fun than having the time delay and having all the, you know, just even yeah. though while it's live with zoom, it's, hard to you know you're making a great point i don't want to cut you off even though i'm thinking about something else and then there's the, yeah. it's just not quite that same vibe as when you're actually in person right across from right across yeah. from each other right yeah totally i agree i agree yeah it's crazy crazy we'll see <laughs> <laughs> no it's definitely uh definitely gonna be interesting that's for sure uh, so another question I kind of had for you, I was just curious, you, you brought up a few names before, but who are some of those people that really kind of uh, mentored you or, or really um, helped you throughout your career, not only skiing, but kind of broadcasting and, and beyond? I mean, I think the skiing part started with, in, in Winter Park, it started with the coaches. I was coached by, you know, Peter Young and Lori Mooney. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Lori's still there. Lori's uh, still there. Yeah. And so, you know, she, she helped launch everything, running the club and everything else made it super fun. That's what I loved about her when I was a young kid skiing on the team. Like she made it so fun. Like she always like bouncing around, checking different groups out, whatever, you know, they'd separate the groups. I mean, the team was like 125 kids deep, you know, it was huge, you know, so she'd cruise around and be, you know, you'd hit something and out of nowhere, you'd hear this, yeah, you know, like yelling and that's kind of the vibe back then. So that crew at Winter Park and then, you know, Sea Dog, when he moved out there, he was 20 years old uh, or 18. I was, I don't know, it was 20 or I was 12, 13 at the time, however the difference is. But like, you know, I met him. He came in and ordered like triple pepperoni pizzas at Pizza Hut when I worked there. And so we started bouncing tramp together. And um, he was a huge, huge influence um, from the start uh, to get rolling into it as far as inverted aerials goes, you know. Um, but really that coaching crew went apart. And then, um, then, you know, there was kind of this area where I was Norams and, you know, there was mixes of coaches then and everything else. And so, um, I don't, I don't even remember the exact crew it kind of right. changed a lot at that time, but that's when I started meeting like Bob Evans, you know, Bobby Evans, Bobby and Tracy Evans brother, mm -hmm. um, you know, Bobby and Tracy even, uh, started the sport. Um, I got her involved with Bobby. Like I helped her get launched into it, but we, we became super tight, super good friends, Chip Milner, um, mm -hmm. some legends uh, on the NORAM circuit. And so that kind of, you know, started uh, getting strong. H Hatchet was, was great. Um, I'd go over to Steamboat and jump at the old Great Western Freestyle Center. 
long story short, I met Haslock and, and these guys embraced me. Like I went and jumped over in Steamboat or I jumped somewhere. And as a, as a, as a young kid, those guys really helped, you know, they were the guys on the team. I wasn't even on the team. Right. But I was jumping at their level almost, and so that was sort of taken under their wing. Yeah. Um, and then that was that was big. Um, and you know, when I made the team, um, it was like Bobby Evans helped me get there. That's when I met Wayne Hilterbrandt, and that's when Hatchet was there. So I started, now I was on the team with this crew. Right. Um, and we just built a huge bond. And, you know, Fuzzy took a year off. Like, I, I didn't even know Fuzz that well. Okay. Okay. So he took 89 off. Mm -hmm. So 89 is when I got on the team. All right. So I, so I had this open window to kick ass and have all this attention because Fuzz mm -hmm. wasn't there for a year. Gotcha. And then he got back on the team in 90. Mm -hmm. And then I was, he was like, oh, shit, who's this guy? <laughs> you know? yeah. And so opposed to, like, competing against me or whatever it was, and he was older, uh, is older, um, he embraced it, and we became best friends. Um, so we were just this solid crew on World Cup of aerial guys with uh, Haslock, Russ Magnatti, you know, Jim Kleiner, Chip Milner, Bobby Evans. It was really cool. Um, with that came all the ballet mogul skiers. So, like, um, Scott Oberin combined skier, Chuck Martin, Bobby Albagiri was on the team when I was there, um, Bolesky, Spina, Bleski was a huge influence. He was so great. Spina was one of my biggest influences, Lane Spina. Mm -hmm. And Ellen Breen was gi a giant influence. And, um, and then Donna Weibrecht, um, we became really good friends. And Donna took me under her wing, too, and, like, helped me in moguls, which was cool. Like, you know, how many people could say that, like, you know, how many dudes would come on and be like, I got to get input by Donna Weibrecht. Like, yeah. if I want to get good, I have to hang with Donna. Right. No, absolutely. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And, you know, at the time, men thought, oh, man, I'm so much, you know, why would I ever right. take advice? But it was yeah. like, I was a shitty tennis player, a mediocre <laughs> tennis player, like getting advice from Serena Williams, you know, right. like, yeah, hey, you better take it when you can get it, you know? Absolutely. Um, but yeah, there's, there's a ton of people and I can name them all day long and, you know, you know who they are, but those guys, you know, did a great job. And, and Wayne Hiltebrandt was probably the best, most, you know, the biggest influence that I had, like coming through the system. Um, to win the 95 world championships. Mm -hmm. um, he was, he was the guy that I competed, you know, at the Olympics with. Um, and then of course, Jeff Good was, you know, who, yeah. who doesn't love Goody, you know? Yeah, I know. <laughs> awesome. So Jeff Winterstein too was in the mix, you know, yeah. And, yeah, yeah. Um, but probably one of the biggest, uh, you know, like through the career, as far as like my, my roommates go, it was like Steve Roxburgh, you know, mm -hmm. competing on in ballet. Right. Um, at the later part of my career when I won Worlds, Kip Griffin, mm -hmm. um, it was just a solid crew. Um, and they all, we we're all fans of each other at the time, you know what I mean? Yeah. Just, uh -huh. uh, I well, it know. seems, I mean, it seems like not only from, from Wayne and, and Goody and, and some of those people, but you had a lot of coaching and help just from, just from other athletes and kind of that camaraderie and pick it, right? You're asking Donna a few different yeah. questions like, hey, what for, for mobile skiing and and things of that nature. So kind of picking not only the getting good interaction with the coaches, but also getting that good vibe with the uh, athletes kind of as well. Yeah. Worlds in 95. I mean, Fuzz didn't make the final round mm -hmm. and I was the only American left. So I was the only shot at getting the medal at Worlds. And uh, this is when Nikki won as well. Mm -hmm. um, and so we like uh, two days before we had control over one jump, like they still do. So they still have control. The U.S. had control over the build of one jump. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I want to make a jump that's so big, like that nobody else will go off it. And because not only was the snow dirty and crusty and bad, if you had a lot of tracks on it, then yeah. it was going to wear out before my jump. So I decided like literally a day before Fuzz and I went out in Wayno and Frank Baird, we built the jump three feet bigger. So we built the jump 14 feet tall. So the triple kickers weren't 14 feet tall at the time. Mm -hmm. We put a 72 degree pitch kick on the end of it. And I was like, I'm going to sky like 10 feet higher than everybody. You know, it's bad <laughs> to do that stuff like in free skiing and right. do something cool. Yeah. And, and they're like, you're nuts, dude. You're not going to even be able to warm up off this without doing a triple. Like nobody yeah. warmed up with triple flips. Yeah. And I was like, I don't care, man. I, I, I got it. You know, nothing to lose here. Um, nobody would jump off it. Nobody did jump off it. Sure enough, just like the biggest air I've ever caught in my life. Like scary <laughs> air. 
and just dropped and it ended up dropping me on the landing hill mm -hmm. so much better than every other jump okay. that it actually paid off because it put yeah. me on the sweet spot because I was so much higher. Um, and then I won worlds and that was probably the biggest, biggest day of my life. Like it was crazy, but to look back and go, you know, these guys kicked in, <laughs> yeah. you know, have some shovels. I mean, yeah. who does that? <laughs> right. No, absolutely. That's uh, That's, that's super cool to hear. That's, yeah, yeah. that's awesome. Those guys, especially not having a great day. They come out like, Hey, let's get, let's get it nice and sweet for you. We'll build this thing up a little bit bigger and here we go. Buckle up. <laughs> Got some salt on it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's but awesome. yeah, tons of it, tons of great influences. And, and of course, you know, it's, you know, my dad and mom were great influences when I was younger and my grandparents, but like my brother was big too. My brother was such a huge fan and, um, you know, he lived in Breckenridge and I just went and stayed with him in Brack and, you know, we, we hung out there and he let me stay there and crash in October, November preseason training and all that stuff. And I was sleeping on his floor. Uh, <laughs> I go out there and just train alone before the world cup started. Um, okay. so, and he's, yeah, we're still super tight. So there's tons of people, as you know, you have a million people that back to your career too. I bet. <laughs> sure. Yeah, no, it's a, it's absolutely, uh, definitely, one, definitely a long one. list. Yeah, for yeah. sure. So kind of, <laughs> I mean, capping it off, you make, uh, you become a member of the U S ski and, uh, snowboard hall of fame. What, what was that like? I mean, looking at you, you know, one of the most decorated, uh, ski athletes uh, in the U.S. No, no, regardless of, of discipline, just skiers in general. I mean, that had to be yeah. quite, quite the, quite the honor. Yeah, it was, it's, it was big. I think it, um, it was, it was a huge deal. Like you, you now are not just in the freestyle world. You're now with all the like alpiners and everything else. And so, you know, I have a, a, a career that was, that was um, paralleled to not paralleled result wise, but I'm talking about like at the same time as as you know, Peekaboo Street and AJ Kit and Diane Roth and mm -hmm. um, Tommy Mo and all these, you know, all these Alpine racers, um, the free skiers really weren't in the mix at the time yet. Um, but yeah, to be sort of, you know, in that group of people was, was huge. Um, you know, that club is a whole different club than just the freestyle skiing club. Um, so it's kind of to be accepted into the world of skiing that isn't just Alpine racing anymore was, 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 was a big honor. Um, not only that, but like Julie Parisian was also, you know, uh, inducted in the same day along with Johnny Mosley. Um, cool. so that was huge. I mean, like Julie yeah. Parisian is a big time Alpine racer that, you know, the world comes <laughs> you know, like, this is so cool. And of course, Mosley, who I felt like I helped mentor in some, you know, in some areas, mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it was sitting next, standing next to me. And, um, but yeah, it's, it's one of those things I use now. It's, it's like a title. Um, you know, my Facebook page, whatever it is, my Instagram page, it's like, you know, even the ski hall of fame guys who run it, um, are like, Hey man, thanks. That's cool. Like nobody, like, yeah. that's hall awesome. Hall you have all this stuff. Yeah. You've done all this stuff and you actually have that on your title. Like, you know, <laughs> yeah. um, so yeah, it's cool. It's, it's super cool. Um, you know, I hope, I hope, uh, more people get into the, into the hall from the freestyle world. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think there'll be, uh, I think there'll be more more yeah. on the horizon hopefully that's for sure yeah we have some good skiers for sure yeah coming up <laughs> so for uh for people out there uh place they can follow you uh online social media yeah i'm like uh, just on instagram trace okay. Scott worthington okay. uh, on instagram um my facebook page on even that's probably my name <laughs> <laughs> yeah um i have that people can follow me there or you know um request or whatever but my facebook or my instagram page is open um and that's about it. My traceworthington.com is, is uh, just a place to, is a, is a business card. <laughs> <laughs> and then also uh, they do get, uh, they could, if, if people have interest, get the opportunity to go out, ski with you for a day, right? Deer Valley. Yeah, uh, they have a cool champions, right? Yeah, yeah. Part of the for, sort of diverse portfolio business uh, yeah. <laughs> going on. Um, you know, Fuzz and I started that program a long time ago. Uh, and then now finally, after many, many years, partnered with Deer Valley. Uh, and so it's, it's pretty, it's a pretty cool program, um, that you can go out ski Jillian Botley and Shannon Barkey and, um, Kaylin Richardson, uh, Chris Waddell, Fuzz, myself. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a fun group and, you know, corporate groups, all that stuff, uh, come skiing with us and get, you know, the full private day, whatever half day, full day and, uh, come ski with Olympians. Yeah. That's, that's great. That's awesome. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time. I really do, uh, I really do appreciate it. And hopefully the next one will be able to do this, uh, in person. I hope. I'm sure we will. Hopefully soon, man.
<laughs> All right. Thanks a lot. Congrats yeah. on the marriage. Congrats All on the right. wedding. Yeah. Thank you very much. All right, brother. All right. Bye, everybody. Hey, everybody. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Please make sure to like, share, and subscribe. And make sure you hit that little bell button so you get notified every time a new episode drops. Thanks.